now. So welcome, welcome to the Way Church Worship. It is good to be together. A couple quick announcements. We have community groups still running. And so we have two options for you to join in the community, in a community group. And that's on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And so Tuesday evenings and or Wednesday evenings, you're invited to join one of our community groups. And you can find out more information if you go online at thewaychurchrva.com. Get more information there. And while you're there, if you haven't yet, fill out a Connect card. We would love to get to know you. And so on that Connect card one, you can get to know us. There's some questions you can ask if you have them. You can find out more information about who we are, what we do, serve teams, or set up a time for a phone call. I would love to get to know you, answer any questions that you may have. And so you can do that quickly and easily through our Connect card by going to the waychurchrva.com. Well, it's good to be together this morning. Next week, as you join us, I invite you to bring your lawn chairs, bring some uh, coverings, and you can pile in right here, uh, and we will continue to worship from our cars or your lawn chairs. We have freedom to do that, and so I invite you to be a part of our worship next week as we look towards Father's Day, and so uh, looking forward to that. All right, we are continuing our series titled Choices, and we're going through the book of Ephesians. And once again, it's called choices because we see in Ephesians 1 that God chose us in him before the foundation of the world. And so that choice of him choosing us drives every other choice that we make. And we see in Ephesians 1.13 that we are put in Christ through our faith in him in the gospel, the good news. And so this series is titled Choices because we make choices based on our relationship with the one true God. And so as we get started and continuing in worship, let me pray for us. Let me pray and ask God's blessing on this time, the reading and preaching of his word, and for our hearts to be prepared to receive what he is telling us this morning. So let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for this beautiful day that you have given us to proclaim your glory. Lord, I ask that you lead and guide every aspect of this gathering And let our hearts and our minds be aimed towards you. Father, settle our minds as sometimes we come in racing in here with all stresses and concerns and anxieties. Give us rest in our minds and let us focus on you, Father. Draw us closer to yourself. Open our minds and our hearts to what you would have us to say here uh, this morning. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, if you're ready to continue worship through God's word, let me ask you just to give a honk of amen this morning again. Chat online, amen, and as you do, grab your Bibles, because we're going to be in Ephesians 6. And this morning, we're going to be in Ephesians 6, 6, specifically in verses 10 through 18. So Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Let me read it, and I invite you to follow along with me this morning. Starting in verse 10 of Ephesians 6 says, Finally, be strengthened by the Lord by his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. For this reason, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist the evil day, having prepared everything to take your stand. Stand, therefore, with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with the readiness of the gospel of peace. In every situation, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request, and stay alert in all with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. In 2000, April 4th of 2000, I joined the Air Force. And at the time, I joined the Air Force, and times just in the world were fairly calm. There was no evidence or thoughts of wars being on the horizon. 
And so I joined the Air Force knowing that war is a possibility or else the military would not exist. But I joined in the Air Force thinking war is not likely, and quite frankly, I can use some money for college. And so in 2000, April 4th, I joined the Air Force. And then September 11th, 2001 happened. Attack that came out of nowhere, shook our nation. We, we were surprised. But even though our country was surprised, our military was surprised, they were ready. They were so ready that 30 days after September 11th, I found myself in Uzbekistan fighting a war that we haven't had for a while, Operation Enduring Freedom. And in my four-year enlistment, I would find myself involved in supporting being deployed to two wars. So I went from nothing being on the horizon to being fully in support of deployed to two wars, Enduring Freedom, September 11th, and then 2003, Iraqi Freedom. And so how things have changed. And so I knew it was possible, not likely, and then I found myself in the midst of being deployed in support of two operations. Why do I say that? Unlike, Unlike wars between nations, nations, which are which easily, easily identifiable, we are, we are in a spiritual war that is, that is much more subtle. subtle. So subtle that I think we don't often even realize that we're in it. And that's what we're going to focus on this morning, is that you are in a spiritual war. This is spiritual warfare. When you came in Christianity, when you gave your life to Christ, you signed up against spiritual war. And to be clear, and we're going to get to this in a minute, everyone, believers and non-believers, are in spiritual warfare. But as you put on Christ, as you came to salvation in him, you signed up to be in opposition against spiritual warfare. And that's not an easy task. When you gave your life to Christ, you surrendered all that you are, all that you have, and all the things that happen to you to the Lordship of Jesus. That's all things. The good, the bad, everything that happens, you know that God is doing something through it. And that's a hard truth. Charles Spurgeon says this, to be a Christian is to be a warrior. The good soldier of Jesus Christ must it not expect to find ease in this world. It is a battlefield. Neither must he reckon upon the friendship of the world, for that would be enmity against God. His occupation is war, speaking of the believer. He puts on peace by peace, this army that's provided to him. He may wisely say to himself, this warns me of danger. This prepares me for warfare. This prophesizes opposition. And that's what we're looking at in the text this morning, is God doesn't tell you to put on the spiritual armor if there's not spiritual warfare. We know if there's a God, there's an adversary. We know there's angels and there's demons. But do we recognize the spiritual warfare? So if you're a note taker, you can title this sermon, Prepare for War. And we're going to have three main points that all goes back to preparing for war. So point number one, prepare for war, be ready. Ready yourselves for war. Ephesians 6.10 again says, finally, be strengthened by the Lord in his vast strength. And this is key, because so many times we want to go through life and just lean on our own strength. Pick ourselves up by our own bootstraps. But God says you cannot fight spiritual warfare with your own strength. We are to lean on him and his vast strength to fight the battles that come to us because we cannot do it on our own. And so question number one, you have to ask yourself, and it comes out of 2 Corinthians 13, 5, where he says, test yourself to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourself. So that's point number one is, are you in the faith? Because to be ready for the spiritual battle, 
you have to be in the faith. Have you given your life to Jesus? I say, if not, it's time to resolve that issue. If so, it's time to stand resolved in your faith. Are we ready for the spiritual battle? Because then in verse 11, it says, put on the armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. Notice it doesn't say so you can avoid them. It doesn't say so you can avoid the schemes of the devil. It doesn't say that you can juke the schemes of the devil or Heisman against the schemes of the devil. It says stand. That means you will have opposition. Are you ready? Because the only way you can stand against the schemes of the devil is through God's vast strength and putting on the armor that he provides you. So here's key, and this is something that I wasn't taught much, especially in my early Christian walk, is how do you recognize the schemes of the devil? How do you recognize spiritual warfare? I'm going to break it down in four different ways, schemes that the evil one, the adversary, the devil uses. He deceives, he distracts, he divides, and he destroys. So he deceives, and this goes back from the very first deception. There in the garden when he says to Eve, did God really say? Start in that deception. And he uses the same schemes today. Did God really say? See, I believe with all my heart that God's word, the Bible, is perfect, infallible, without any mixture of error, and is authoritative and relevant today. But the evil one would say, did God really say? Surely he didn't mean all of that. Did God really say? And so he tempts us, but we have to understand that the evil one is the father of lies. So you have to know the truth to recognize the lie. Jesus in John 8, 44 says, He, speaking of the devil, was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature. Because he is a liar and the father of lies. So to be able to recognize the lie that whispers in your ears from the adversary, you have to know the truth. So know, number one, He is a deceiver and always has been. Number two, he distracts. He sends distractions. He draws your attention away from the spiritual to the superficial and draws our attention naturally to what's right in front of us, what we can see. A couple examples. I've had the benefit and the blessing to be able to go and engage an unreached, unengaged people group, people that have never heard the gospel in southeast China. Two examples of spiritual warfare that I saw there. We had the opportunity, we we got invited into one lady's house, and she made us lunch. And over lunch, God opened the door to start sharing the gospel, creation to Christ. And so you start with creation. You go into why there's one true God and everything else is false. And then he proved that Jesus is God in the flesh, the way to salvation. And so we're walking through probably 20 minutes of me speaking through an an interpreter and then going back and forth, answering some questions. And when we got to Jesus, the center point of the gospel, all of a sudden she got up and started cleaning the house. So I washing pans and I would look at our missionary and the interpreter and we're just kind of like, okay, and so we wait. She got distracted. She eventually came back. We waited, and we were able to finish the gospel. And she didn't believe at that point. But Lord willing, God uses that to bring her to himself. That was just a small example of the spiritual battle that you see right in front of you, the distraction that there is. And God just called us just to wait, wait through the distraction. A second village we went to, we were talking to another, uh, one of the, the men there. We were having all these conversations, just building the relationship. 
having a good dialogue. Again, about 20, 30 minutes, we're sitting here talking to this man. And right when we get to bridge into the gospel to start shifting into a spiritual conversation, wouldn't you know that all of a sudden he could not understand our interpreter anymore? Just couldn't do it. And our interpreter is the missionary there. And so at that point, he got frustrated, and the conversation died after several minutes of trying to figure out what is going on, where is the break, the break in the communication. He stopped being able to understand our interpreter. So the spiritual battle is real, but it's not just real in Southeast Asia. It's real here. Again, we're talking about Satan uses distraction. Deception, distraction. Let me give you another case in point. Today, right now, there's a lot of distraction happening in our country and in our city. Distraction. There's a lot of rioting going on. Because of oppression, which is a scheme of the devil. It is sin. Because of discrimination, racism, all these different things that are happening that naturally draw our attention and should. But we have to remember these are gospel issues. The root of all this is sin. I've seen some, conversa some conversations between believers and say, don't go down to the riots to try and preach the gospel. What? I, my mind is blown at that. Let me be honest. Because the gospel is what God uses in tandem with his Holy Spirit to bring people to himself, to reconcile relationships between each other and himself. The gospel is of utmost importance. But we're going down there to love people. We go everywhere to love people, not to try and win arguments. We share the gospel out of love for others. It goes back to our mission statement, right? Love God, love others, and make disciples. But we get so wrapped around the axles, and within Christianity, we want to debate our own opinions based on this superficialness that the deceiver has distracted us with. Another example is these statues, right? I know we all have opinions on these statues, but don't let them be a barrier for the gospel. Four years ago, this came up. The Southern Baptist Convention told, asked, they can't tell you anything because we're autonomous churches, they asked the churches not to display the battle flag. Would you believe I saw debates come up that said, we can do whatever we want with Christians. You can't tell me not to display the battle flag. You're right, I can't tell you. But the reason being is because it's a stumbling block to those coming to Christ. I'm not going to tell, gonna you, tell you whether to display a battle flag or not. I will say, make the gospel a priority in your life. And don't let this distraction keep you from living out the calling that God has in your life to glorify him with everything that you do, all that you are, and remove any stumbling blocks and barriers doing all things for the sake of the gospel. That's what I'm saying. Let's not lose focus on the most urgent matter that there's sin in the world, and people need Jesus. And only the relationship with Jesus changes people. So when you see the rights, when you see these statues coming down, when you see opinions and preferences, all these things being tossed out, that should send us to our knees in prayer and respond in love for the sake of the gospel. Does that make sense? Makes sense? Because I need you to track with me. What I'm getting at is don't be distracted, don't be deceived. The gospel is primary sin is the underlying issue what we see and the only thing that solves that is jesus he is the way the truth and the life so the evil one deceives he distracts he divides so take that same distraction and the illustrations i just gave of some local politics some local just movements we have an election coming up do not let that election come a distraction and divide us we have unity in christ continue to lead on that discuss yes discuss opinions but don't let them override loving one another don't let it happen because that causes divisions and that is what satan uses deception distraction divisions again the military attacker right divide and conquer 
which leads us to the fourth one, and that's destroys. The evil one is bent on your destruction. He just is, and we have to understand that. John 10.10, 10, when Jesus is talking about him being the good shepherd, he then talks about the, the thief. And really, it's the schemes of the devil, and it describes what the adversary is. In John 10.10, 10, he says, A thief comes to only steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it in abundance. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus gives life, and he gives it in abundance because of who he is and us being in him. Chuck Lawless says this. I thought this was just really well written. He says, since the fall in the Garden of Eden, the devil has tried to bait us with false teaching, lure us into sin, and turn us against each other. He does this to keep us from glorifying God and doing the Great Commission. He seeks to devour us so that we can no longer be the light in a lost world. The enemy wants us to mess up, fall into sin. He wants us to get up, give up, get discouraged, get puffed up, live in arrogance, and slip up to divide and shut up to quit evangelizing. So realizing the schemes of the devil, they're not always apparent. They're not always right in front of our face. But realizing the underlying issues and that what the adversary does to divide, to destroy, to deceive, to ultimately conquer. And we know, and this is what's amazing to me, we know how this ends. We know that one day Jesus will return and all those that are in him are more than conquerors and he will come to restore all things, to make all things new. And so I feel like sometimes we just live like we're being conquered when we are more than conquerors because of who Christ is. Let's start living like it. So again, the three points. Are you ready? How do you recognize, prepared for, recognizing the scheme of the devil, and finally respond? And I'll point you back to Ephesians 6. In verse 14, it says, Stand. Stand, therefore, with the truth, like a belt around your waist, in righteousness like armor on your chest. The truth. Stand in the truth. God's word is truth. And then what did Jesus say? Just said it a minute ago. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Stand in the truth. In all these parts of the armor, if you don't remember all six parts, that okay, that's okay. Remember this. Romans 13, verse 14 says, put on Christ Jesus. Put on Christ Jesus. He is the truth. You put it on, you live it out, but you have to know the truth to be able to do and abide and live out the truth. Live out the promises of the truth. 2 Timothy 2 24 through 26 says the Lord's servant must not be quarrel must not quarrel but must be gentle to everyone able to teach and patient instructing his opponents with gentleness how are we doing with that perhaps God will grant them repentance leading them to the knowledge of the truth then listen to me then they may all, they come to their senses and escape the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. The truth, Jesus says, the truth will set you free. The truth, Jesus is the truth and God's word is true. And then the righteousness. When you're in Christ Jesus, you have brought, been brought from death to life being unrighteous under God's wrath to being declared righteous because you have the righteousness of Christ. And remember that because the scheme of the devil will tell you you're not worthy. You'll never be worthy. You remember that thing you did yesterday? Yeah, God doesn't hear you. 
That's where you got to know the truth. The Word says that we're in Christ Jesus, and because we're in Christ Jesus, you are declared righteous, and God hears your prayers because of what Jesus did for you. There's no more barrier that used to be up there. That sin barrier has been removed because of the blood of Jesus. You have been declared righteous. The gospel of peace in Ephesians 6.15. So you got truth, righteousness, the gospel of peace. You have been brought from under God's wrath in Christ Jesus to have peace with God. And now we walk in that peace because of Christ Jesus. And we literally have God dwelling inside of us. So are we walking in that peace? And do we really understand that God is sovereign over all things, including all things in your life? When Jesus tells us not to worry and don't be anxious, that's not because things are going to be just great when you come to Christ. There's a very destructive gospel out there, and we've talked about it here. The prosperity gospel says if you just have enough faith, this will happen. If you just believe enough, God has the best for you. You know what the best is? First and foremost is God himself. Secondly, 1A, if you will, He is with us and goes before us. But it doesn't promise us that we won't have hard times. He does promise us that he's with us in those hard times, and he's doing something with those hard times. But we need to remember this when you go through those hard times, because our natural reaction is to blame God. God, why'd you do this to me? Guess what? God didn't do it. He allowed it to happen. We do live in a sinful, fallen world. But if we really trust God, when we came to Jesus and all that we are, all that we have in every circumstance, then we know that God's doing something good with it that maybe we'll never see. Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for the good, for those who love God, for who are called according to his purpose. That doesn't mean it's going to happen like you think it should. But that's where your faith kicks in. Like, I don't know what this looks like. This is the hardest thing has ever happened. And for those that say God won't put on you more than you can bear, let me hear, let me, let me tell you this. He will. What that means is that you don't bear that on your own. He bears that with you. Does that make sense? We're going to come through some tough times. What do you do with them? Do you blame God or do you go running back to God, realizing that he is still sovereign, resting in his peace? The shield of faith. And when I saw this, starts, I'm kind of a, uh, an Avengers nerd. And so I think of Captain America, this big shield that nothing can break it. Nothing. Unless you follow Avengers and you think of oh, Thanos, right? Anybody tracking that? Okay, maybe that's me. Just trying to get the gauge of the crowd here. The f- shield of faith. Don't let your faith be shaken. I hear that phrase throw down a lot. My faith has been shaken, or I've lost my faith. That's not a thing. You can't lose something that was first given to you and then sealed. Ephesians 1 says you were sealed by the Holy Spirit. So my argument, well, I've lost my faith or I've walked away from my faith. You never had the faith to begin with. Don't let your faith be shaken. Our flesh is shaken. Because we still have this struggle with our flesh. But don't let your faith be shaken because your faith isn't based on your circumstances or yourself. Your faith isn't based in who Jesus is and that he's conquered sin, sin, death, death. He's redeeming you for himself as a precious possession as a child of God and he's doing something with your life. And if that wasn't true, at the moment of your salvation, why were you not ball rocketed to heaven? Because God is still working in you and through you. But he hasn't removed you from difficulties, from the scheme of the devil. And then finally, verse 17. The helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And please recognize that both of these things are only gathered and grabbed when danger is imminent. The helmet of salvation, knowing that you are secure in Christ Jesus, and that knowing that all these trials, these persecutions, these circumstances, these difficulties 
are momentary light afflictions, is what the scripture says. Why? Because God is coming soon. Jesus is coming back soon and will take you with him and restore all things. And you'll spend eternity worshiping the risen Lord again. So persevere. Persevere. Remember your salvation. And then finally, take up the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. So to be able to use the Word of God, we have to know the Word of God. That's why I make a big deal of knowing the truth. You have to spend time in God's Word to be able to know it and use it. So this is both knowing the Word of God and using the Word of God. If you recognize this, it's the only offensive weapon in the armor of God. And going back to the perfect example, Jesus, after his baptism, what happened? He was led into the desert and tempted by the evil one. But what did Jesus do? Remember, he was fully God, yet fully human. He combated every temptation that the evil one threw his way with the word of God. He's saying if it's good enough for Jesus, it's probably good enough for us. You combat the schemes of the devil, the lies of Satan, by knowing the truth, relying on the truth, and then using the truth against the father of lies and his deceptions. The sword of the Spirit. And so, you may ask, how do you put on this armor of God, Josh? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because then we come to verse 18. It says, pray at all times in the Spirit. With every prayer and request, stay alert with all perseverance. Pray at all times and stay alert. So how do you put on the armor of God? You abide in Christ. You're praying at all times. Relying on his spirit for strength. The God that has the vast strength for you. His arm is not short. Who is near? So let me ask you this as we close. Are you prepared for war? Are you prepared for war? Because this battle is against everyone, everywhere, believers and unbelievers alike. 1 Corinthians 4, 4 through 5 says this, and let this be an eye-opening scripture and a burden for us. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4 says, But if the gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we are not proclaiming ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as servants for Christ's sake. Are you prepared for war? Have you put on Christ Jesus, Romans 13, 14? Have you come to him and given your whole selves in faith, knowing that somehow that his death was enough to pay for your sins? And because of his sacrifice, you now have peace, relationship with God the Father because of Christ Jesus, him alone, by his grace alone, through your faith alone. So for the first time right now in this parking lot or online, if you have yet to give your life fully to Jesus, I invite you to do that right now. As I pray, I invite you just to pray in your own words, surrendering to Jesus. Say, I admit that I'm a sinner. I've come up short. Try to do things my own way. But believe that your death paid the price for my sins so I can live with you right now and forever. And I confess you as Jesus, my Lord of my life, all that I have, and all that happens. Say that in your own words. Those that are in Christ, just pray for his strength. Pray for perseverance. Pray for opportunities as you go out to glorify him. And how you can be his witnesses, light in a dark world. So I invite you to pray with me as we close this time. Just respond how God is leading you this morning. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your truth, Lord. Continue just to saturate us with your presence, 
Fill us with your spirit, Father. And I pray that right now you bring many to yourself for the first time. Right now that you're bringing many to yourself to walk closer. Lord, help us in our faith. Build our faith in you to walk in full dependence on you and not of ourselves. In full dependence in light of the gospel and not in our opinions. Father, give us strength to persevere and to be your witnesses for your glory to a hurting, lost world that's been deceived in so many different ways. Father, we thank you for being faithful. We thank you for being here. And we thank you for Christ Jesus. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And for, so today we're going to do things a little bit different. And so for those streaming online, we're going to keep the stream going. I'm going to invite Andy down, and he's going to present the offering for us. But then we're going to keep streaming because we get to celebrate what God's doing in individual lives through baptism. So don't go anywhere. We're going to just transition just for a minute. Amen. It's glad to see so many of you guys here today. Nothing brings people together like worshiping and serving the God together. Amen. Yes, we wanted to, to thank those that came out yesterday and uh, helped us with uh, Compassion RVA and, and feeding the homeless. Um, you know, there was a lot that was given online, too, so we wanted to express our gratitude for that as well. Um, and we, if you felt led to give to, uh, to the church, you can connect with us at the R, the way church, rva.com. You can go out there and fill out a Connect card as well um, and, and give online as you feel led. Uh, we also, you can text uh, to 84321 and give through your through your mobile device, your phone, uh, or you can do the old-fashioned way. We'll have a couple of guys out with the, the blue buckets where you can just you know, give as you feel led. Uh, but we'd like to just thank you for your contribution and just giving back to God's kingdom and spreading the gospel. Let me share just two passages on why do we do this thing called baptism? What's it about? Well, first, let me submit that Jesus himself was baptized, so that's a pretty good example and a reason to be baptized. Second, it's a command. So I'll be very clear that there's two baptisms that the Bible teaches. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is what you receive God's presence in you at the moment you believe. But then the second baptism is baptism by submersion in water. And we say submersion because literally the Greek baptism means submerse. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus says, All authority has been given to me and has always even to the end of the age. So as a disciple, we are commanded to be baptized and to baptize. We are commanded to be taught and to teach. Those are all elements of disciple making. But then Romans 6 says this. Romans 6, 4 says, Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead for the glory to the Father, so we too may walk in the newness of life. So we're baptized out of obedience and we're baptized out of love for the Savior, wanting to identify with him and to show the local church, because I believe baptism is best represented in the local church, the inward work, what God did as an outward expression, symbolism. So like I said, as the believer goes underwater, they're confessing, confessing that the old self is dead. I'm identifying in Christ Jesus. And when they come out of the water, they're confessing that I am now a new creation because of Christ Jesus. So this is a special time, a special moment. So feel free to take pictures, come closer. And uh, we are going to celebrate together with these three men as they profess their belief, Lord and Savior, before you. And so baptism works two ways. They're confessing Jesus as Lord, but they're submitting to accountability to the one another's. We talked about that a few weeks ago. And so we are to walk in discipleship and accountability to the one another's, the local church. And so I'm excited to invite 
these three men. And so first, I'm going to invite Caleb Weatherspoon to come up. And so as we know, he's a especially special to Caleb Weatherspoon. Weatherspoon is, is, my, is son. my son. And so Caleb, and Caleb do, you do you believe that you receive salvation by God's grace alone, through your faith alone, in Christ alone? Yes. So what confession are you wanting to make before everyone here this morning? That the Lord is my God of my life. Amen, amen, amen. All right. So based on his confession of faith, and yeah, get excited, this is good. Based on his confession of faith, I'm baptizing Caleb Weatherspoon in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. with him in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life of Christ Jesus. All right, Daryl Smith, brother, we'll have you come on in. So, brother, Daryl. Do you believe this morning, your confession is that you have been saved by God's grace alone, by faith alone, through Jesus Christ alone? Yes, I do. So with that, what are you confessing before your church this morning? Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Amen, amen. All right. Well, based on your confession of faith, brother, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, next, Brother Mike Dolan. Mike, come on up, brother. Brother, Mike, this morning, do you believe and are you confessing that you have been saved by God's grace alone, through your faith alone, through Jesus Christ alone? Yes, I do. And based on that confession of faith, what are you confessing before everyone here this morning that jesus is my lord and savior amen amen so based on your confession of faith it is my privilege and joy once again to baptize you in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit Buried with him in baptism raised to walk in the newness of life in christ jesus amen amen Amen. This is so awesome. Can we give again a big shout of praise? If you're in your car still, let's honk for what God is doing here this morning. Praise God. And so we are going to transition again. The gospel is being clearly represented and symbolized through baptism. And every week, I'll invite you, we take communion, the Lord's Supper, and that's remembering what Jesus did in our lives. And so the Lord's Supper, as we take the communion, the elements, this is for believers in Christ Jesus because you're remembering what he did for you and what that price, what it cost you. And so let me just pray for us as we settle our hearts, prepare for communion, examine ourselves, reflect on the goodness of God, and just use the next few moments just to ready yourselves and ourselves for the Lord's Supper. Father, I thank you for you are so good. Lord, we are so unworthy of your amazing love, and yet you have called us worthy. Father, we thank you for your love poured out for us through Christ Jesus. We thank you for calling us to yourselves, choosing us in you, Father. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives, Lord, and this time as we come to communion, settle our hearts, prepare us to ex experience your grace again as we reflect 
on your goodness. Help us to examine ourselves. And if there's anything lingering, any sin issues, Father, bring us to repentance. Change our mind. Help us to see that those are issues and they do not bring you glory, Father, and forgive us of those. Father, we thank you for this time as we prepare for the Lord's Supper. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. On behalf of The Way Church, I would like to thank you for choosing to worship online with us this morning. Would you let us know what God's doing in your life right now? Maybe for the first time you have given your life to Jesus. Or maybe you're renewing your commitment to Christ. Or maybe you're wanting to take the next step on your faith journey and be baptized. Right now, you can go online and fill out our Connect card at thewaychurchrva.com. We would love to pray for you, pray with you, and walk alongside you on your faith journey. And faith family members, I would like to invite you to continue worship through giving because we believe that giving is worship. And you can give safely and securely right now at thewaychurchrva.com or you can text the amount that you would like to give to 84321. So church, as a church, let me continue to encourage you to be the church and go and make disciples.